everyone, and thank you so much for joining our Cherry Beckert session today. My name is Madeline Robbins, and I'm our production manager here at Cherry Beckert. We have an excellent session for you, and I see that we have a great representation of folks from the Midwest, uh, East Coast, um, you know, Upper Northeast. So thank you for being on today. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers, and uh, our topic today is how to avoid the traps and take advantage of state tax opportunities for the professional service industry. So as we get started, um, let's go ahead and take a look at our CPE. This session is going to be free of charge and also recorded for you to play back later uh, if you need to reference anything. So to receive CPE credit, you must answer at least three of the four polling questions and attend for the full 15 minutes. Those CPE certificates will be issued within 10 days. If you have not received yours after 10 days, email cbhlearning at cbh.com. A recorded version will also be available in about a week, posted to our website and also sent out to you via email. Now, if you have any questions during the webinar, there is a Q&A box down at the bottom. Go ahead and an enter any of those questions down there and we will address them as soon as possible. We will also send out a short survey at the conclusion of the session. We value your feedback and just hope that you take part. With that, I'm happy to introduce uh, one of our speakers today, Kathy Stanton. Uh, please, Kathy, take it away. Great, thank you, Maddie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's afternoon for everybody on, that's on the call. If there's someone on the West Coast, still good morning. Uh, but my name is Kathy Stanton, and I lead the state and local tax practice for Cherry Beckert. And we have a great uh, panel of speakers from our state and local tax group today. Uh, Peter Beisch is a senior manager in our state tax group. Edward Osefo is also a senior manager in our state tax group, and Tony Conkle, who's a manager uh, in, our, in our state tax group. So we have two CPAs and two attorneys on the call. Uh, so we, we have all kinds of wisdom that we can share with everybody. So I will go to the agenda now. We'll, we'll discuss a bit of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we are focused on the professional services industry or really service providers in general. There are unique state local tax implications for that industry. And I would suspect that's why we have a lot of people that are very interested in this webinar today. So we, we divided the presentation in three parts. Um, a lot of different aspects can go into each of these, but the first is simply nexus. And nexus, um, we're going to talk specifically about income franchise. There are different nexus standards for sales and use tax. However, in the professional services industry, except for you know possibly a lot of computer software and equipment, things like that, uh, generally the sales of professional services are not going to be subject to sales tax. So we are limiting this webinar to the income franchise tax area. So we will first talk about nexus. Uh, then we will talk about sourcing of revenue, uh, which is becoming more and more of a concern all the time. And then thirdly, we will talk about state pass-through entity tax elections. If you have not heard about these yet, you really need to pay attention here, especially if you're very profitable because there are a lot of benefits that are available. And so we really want to make sure that everybody is obtaining the value of those elections. Uh, so we could go to the next slide. And I think uh, we start off here with the first polling question. Uh, what, and this is um, always curious, what's your level of state tax knowledge and how it applies to your company? So are you, do you consider yourself very knowledgeable about state tax matters, somewhat knowledgeable, no real knowledge, but you're placing your trust in your tax provider, so you don't really, you know, worry about it that much. Um, or you choose to just avoid the topic at all costs. Uh, let them find us, and and we do have we we do have clients like that. And hopefully, they're not getting ready to sell their company because that's usually a problem if they've ignored the state and local tax obligations. But we're always ready to help them out and get get clean before selling as well. Or, or not sure if you're just haven't really been involved in the tax area and you just want to learn more and you're just not sure uh, about state and local tax in general and how it applies to your company. So we'll give it a minute and I'm sure we will get the answers popping up once we get the amount of time that needs to pass 
for CPE because everybody, oh, I better do that. Oh gosh, Maddie, I missed it. Oh, you got to add me for that one. That's <laughs> okay. So as long as you get three, and that's a good reminder for everybody else too. If you missed <laughs> one, just get three of them. You'll be good to go. That's so funny because I just remembered I need to answer them for CPE. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, great. 58% somewhat knowledgeable. Okay. So you've had discussions, uh, you're, you're working with your company or in your tax provider in this area. Um, some have very knowledgeable. That's great. Uh, and then 22% uh, trusting in your tax provider. Uh, I love to see that it's only 1% that you're choosing to avoid the topic. That's great. Um, so good. Okay. So that helps us to adjust what we're talking about, what level of detail we might go into uh, by understanding your knowledge level. Okay, so we will turn it over to Edward to talk about Nexus. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, next slide. So Nexus is a term that essentially it means a connection between the taxpayer and the state that will provide, I guess, sufficient context with the state to allow the state to impose tax and a filing requirement on a taxpayer. Uh, historically, Nexus, historically, Nexus has is a concept where you would have to have physical presence in the state. Next slide, please. You would have to have physical presence in the state that would allow for the state to impose a tax filing requirement on you. But as we've gone to a more digital economy, the internet's prevalent and companies are, or customers are all over the place, there's this concept of economic presence Nexus. So now we've gone from, if you have physical presence in the state, allowing the state to impose tax on you. Now you can uh, purposefully direct your context to a state. And now a state is, is broadening the terminology to this economic nexus principle so that you can also, they could bring in taxpayers to bring in revenue into the state and to have tax requirement, tax filing requirements on those new uh, taxpayers. And specifically for professional service providers and businesses, they need to examine this footprint because you could have employees working in several states, but then customers are in other states uh, and providing services. So it's, it's, a, it's a very important topic for, for professional service providers. Next slide. So in terms of economic, next, economic presence nexus and definition, states define it differently, but for the most part in general, it means it's a principle that a taxpayer has purposely directed their business activity to a state sufficient enough for that taxpayer to be taxed in the state, regardless of whether or not they're present in the state through employees or property, or if they have any type of varying levels of activity in the state. And there's two types of uh, economic presence nexus. There's this objective standard, it's a fact of presence nexus, which essentially it states that you reach a bright line threshold in terms of X amount of sales, X amount of property, or X amount of payroll in the state will be sufficient enough to uh, have nexus in that type of economic nexus in that state. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, then there's this subjective type of economic presence, which is more of a broad, you know, fluffy language doing business nexus and doing business within the state. So essentially it's broad in the sense that if you're doing business, which could be have several definitions, some states don't define it at all, but if you're doing some type of business activity, transacting some type of uh, activities within a state, that's enough for them to impose their taxing requirement and, and bring you into the state to have a filing requirement within the state. Next slide. So there's this um, multi-state tax commission, which essentially they put forth model regulations to try to make states uniform in terms of their fact of presence nexus standard. And states, of course, don't like to be uniform. They like to be different. So there aren't a lot of states that uh, adopt the MTC standard, but for the most part, the MTC standard states that if you have 50,000 or 25% of total property in the state, you have an, it's sufficient enough to have a uh, nexus with the state. If you have 50,000 or 25% of your total payroll in the state, that's sufficient enough for, for economic nexus within the state. Or if you have 500,000 or more of sales or 25% of your total sales within the state, that's sufficient enough to impose a nexus uh, nexus and filing requirement on a company. Next slide. So as you see in this heat map here, a lot of states do not conform to the MTC standards. Only one state, uh, Tennessee, fully conforms. And then there are a number of states who, you know, they don't have a fact of presence nexus standard at all. So you kind of see the varying state, you know, uh, differences within the state. However, the states that do have some sort of fact of presence nexus standard within their statutes and regulations, they have lifted or taken a page out of the MTC standard and just written it into their state statute, but they may not 
fully conform or conform to the MTC standard. So there are some states that have this factor presence nexus standard where they state if you have 50,000 or more of sales in the state or a property in the state, you have nexus, 50,000 more of payroll, it's enough for economic nexus or 500,000 or more of sales within the state, it's, an, it's sufficient enough for uh, economic nexus. Hey, Edward, I'll jump in there because there was a, a question that came in. You know, does this mean if you don't have, if you have salaries in the state, but it doesn't rise to that 50,000, do you have nexus or is it kind of like a safe harbor? And unfortunately, again, we have to caveat it is a state by state uh, analysis because the states have different statutes, but generally it's not a safe harbor, meaning that when you have an employee in the state, the majority of states are going to consider that you have nexus. Um, it, it becomes really gray. If there's like a back office employee that's the, and you're not directing activity in the state and there's less than 50,000 of payroll, then that could, that could be okay. Um, but if you're actually purposefully directing activity to that state, if you have an employee and uh, the employee, it's less than 50,000, states are generally gonna view that as nexus. Although we really see the sales factor being the big factor to watch here. Um, as soon as your sales become a certain amount, because you still have to have that substantial connection. Uh, so if you had an employee and only had no sales then you don't have any tax, right? So you might have nexus, but no tax. Um, but I, I just wanna caution people, in most states, maybe not all states, once you have that employee and a direction of uh, purposefully availing the market in that state, generally that is going to create nexus. It's not necessarily a safe harbor. Yep, that's good. Uh, next slide. So doing business nexus. So essentially, if you recall earlier, the doing business nexus standard is more of a subjective uh, standard. So states that don't have this uh, bright line factor present standard will sometimes have some type of doing business language or doing business uh, statute within their within their regs. Uh, these are a few uh, states example of the language. So for example, Illinois, uh, income tax is opposed for the privilege of earning or receiving income in the state. That could be broadly defined as, you know, you just send an email to someone in the state. It's just, it's one of those terms that it's not really specifically defined, but it's broad enough to encompass a lot of different activities within the state. You know, if you see Idaho, if you transact or authorize to transact business in the state, then you have enough to be doing business in the state for, for nexus purposes. So it's really more of a broad language that allows for the state to try to reach a, a companies and pull companies with revenue into their state because they are purposely availing themselves to the, the laws of the state and actually doing some type of business activity within the state. Uh, next slide. So the nexus footprint. So there's several different considerations that, you know, as professional service providers, you should take into account. So for example, a company is generally considered to be doing business in the state if they have this physical presence or this employee working in the state. Uh, now, post COVID, or let's back up a little bit. During COVID, a lot of states have imposed some type of emergency regulations so that, you know, when you have employees working in the state, that wasn't enough to subject the company to nexus in the state. But now that we're in the post COVID world, a lot of those uh, emergency regulations regarding remote workforce has sunset. So a lot of states have gone back to their previous uh, rules and regulations with regards to having employees within the state. So a remote workforce can now dramatically impact the state's uh, state tax nexus footprint because if those remote employees never came back into the office, now you do have a physical presence in the state. And that physical presence in the state is enough to subject you to, uh, you know, nexus filing requirements or tax being imposed on your company because of that uh, nexus within the state. Another consideration is payroll tax obligations. So now that you have remote workforce, you have employees where you now have to withhold uh, in the state where they're either performing the services or in the state where now they're residing. So these are different types of considerations that you now have to look for because now you have employees all over and maybe historically they were all in the company state, but now they're all over the, the country. And so you have to take these different things into account when you're discovering nexus and where you should be filing. Next slide. So more generally speaking, you know, businesses should look to withhold, you know, income or payroll withholding tax in the states where either the employee is living or the state where the employee is performing services or the state of their, their employment. So 
there are some exception, exceptions to this rule, or most specifically, you know, some, some type of exceptions are some states have a reciprocal work agreement. And essentially, these are states maybe that are located in, you know, metropolitan areas uh, where there are neighboring states who maybe you live in one state, but you commute and work in a different state. And so we called out an example such as Pennsylvania, they have this reciprocal agreement with uh, Indiana, Maryland, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, and West Virginia, which is essentially the neighboring states. So if you have a PA resident now working in New Jersey, the employer would still withhold PA tax because of this reciprocal work agreement instead of New Jersey tax. You, you have to be careful in that, in that regard because not all states have this reciprocal agreement with, with neighboring states. And so the, it defaults back to the general rule, you know, where you would withhold for payroll tax purposes in the state where the services are being performed or where the employee resides or where their, their home is. Yeah, and I'll jump in just a, a quick note as well. Unemployment tax does not follow the same thing as income tax withholding. So for unemployment tax, so income tax withholding, you could have various states. There was a question in the chat with regard to that. Depending on where the employee is working that day, you could potentially have withholding. Now, unfortunately, it's not uniform throughout all the states. Some states will have, you know, if it's a if they haven't been there, that employee has not been present for two weeks you don't have to withhold. So there are various, some states have various thresholds. So you, there's a variety of issue or outcomes there depending on the state, but unemployment's always gonna be one state. And it's generally gonna be that where they're generally located. If they work from home, they're com completely uh, telecommute or uh, telework, then it would be that state of residence. If they report to a certain office and they perform some of the services in that office, it's gonna be that state with the office state. So unemployment would just be one or the other. So now we move on to the, in the remote workforce environment and teleworking. There's this concept of the convenience of the employer rule. And this is a rule where it's only adopted by well, apparently about five states, Delaware, New England, New York, PA, and Connecticut. But it essentially states that if your business is located in a convenience of the employer state and the employer requests that the employee work in a different location, the, you would, the employee would be subject to withholding based on where the employee is now working. However, which has, was prevalent during the, you know, COVID and, and post-COVID, if you have an employer located in the convenience of the employer state, and the employee is working in a totally different state because of, you know, that's where they worked during COVID or that's where they resided or moved to, you know, post COVID. Now the convenience of the employer rule becomes very big because now you would withhold still where the employer is located. And this has been a big issue with New York being a big metropolitan state, but the employees who work, let's say in New Jersey or New England or some other, or Maryland, for instance, you would still withhold for payroll tax purposes in New York because of this convenience of the employer rule that's in place uh, for the state. Yeah, and there's really some constitutional issues probably sometimes with that, especially now, like if you think about New York and imposing this rule, if the general office and where they report to is in New York, they're saying it's New York withholding. We don't care if you're, you never enter the state. If, if you report to this office and the employer itself doesn't have an office in that state where you're working, that's the key. You have to have a bona fide office in that state, and then it could be that state's withholding. So apart from that, it's New York uh, income tax withholding. Well, what happened during COVID was like a lot of the, the businesses, the city just shut down, right? So it just shut down. There really wasn't anybody, well, maybe not anybody, but a good argument for many businesses that we didn't actually have a functioning operating office in New York. So how can you say it's all New York back to the home office? Because there really wasn't any home office there at the time. So I think that that could have some successful challenges if, if someone wanted to make a challenge. And um, the other thing I would mention is Connecticut is, is only uh, cost of performance or I'm sorry, uh, the convenience of the employer, in these words, the convenience of the employer for certain states. They only impose that rule on the other states that impose this rule. <laughs> so Connecticut and a state that does not have it for the convenience and employer rule, then they will not impose it in that situation. So it's a, a little bit different. Go ahead. Next one. Uh, so these are just some key takeaways for companies to consider. So you should regularly assess, you know, your Nexus profile due to either changes in operation or just changes in the state Nexus rules. Um, you should also, you know, just given the, the remote workforce, uh, 
employees working remotely in a different state than an employer, that could trigger, you know, tax implications. So you, that's something to consider and not just, you know, same as last year approach where you're just withholding, let's say, where the employer is located, you should really consider where the employees are now located and where you should be if, if that's rising to the level of a filing requirement due to nexus or what the what the uh, the issue what would be the case there also post covid uh companies should they could now have nexus in these new states due to the remote workforce so that could be new filing requirements new obligations new registration requirements so these are things that should be considered and looked at and not just a, a same as last year type of approach uh also just consider how the state nexus footprint could affect either internal policies. If there's some type of remote workforce policy that's been put in place post COVID, but states are still imposing nexus on, you know, where employees are located, if you have physical presence. So these type of internal policies may not have an impact for tax purposes. So all these things should be considered when you have employees that are, you know, all over the place or, or no longer in the, the traditional work environment. All right, next slide. So we have a polling question number two. When does your company last review its Nexus footprint? A, less than six months ago, between six months and 18 months ago, more than 18 months ago, or not sure? And I'll give you some time to answer that. I got my vote in that time. Make sure you, make sure you get yours in, Edward. Good job. <laughs> And typically, we would recommend you know every one or two years to do a uh, a nexus study just to review in case there's been changes in business operation, in case you know you have new employees come on board, or just traveling to different states just to stay up to date so that you're not caught flat footed, you know, entering yeah. the state and not knowing that. I like I like calling it a nexus review as opposed to a study. A study sounds like it's hours and hours and weeks and weeks, and it's going to be really expensive. But actually, we have a a pretty um, streamlined version of a nexus review that we could do it for minimal investment and we build out a tool that helps with that um and you know ideally especially for professional services you may need to do that um each year to, if your clients are changing customers are changing um but but what happens there and this will be a this will be a good handoff well we'll let we'll let the poll answer come up when it comes up we'll address that but it comes down to how do you source the income, right? Because if you're, how do I, how do I know I, I met the 500,000 bright line threshold if I don't know what revenue is attributable to the state? And a lot of our clients think they have that, right? Well, I have a sales by state, you know, and it, it nicely ties to 100% of the sales of our company. Well, we know it's incorrect because the states have different sourcing rules. And so sometimes we get, and, and Peter will go into that more detail, but we kind of end up having more of a sourcing issue. So 37% less than six months ago have, have done some type of review of their Nexus footprint. I, I'm sure that it's probably related to property and payroll and hopefully sales. Sales by state is really important now. Um, and the rest are kind of, uh, so the majority having, you know, have, are, are on top of it. Over 50% have, have looked at it in the last 18 months. So that's great. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Edward. Appreciate that. And we will transition then to the sourcing of revenue, which is extremely important for this industry. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, and it's great to be here this afternoon with everybody on this webinar. Um, at this point, as Kathy mentioned, I'm going to be discussing the sourcing issues that are applicable to the professional services industry. Um, as Edward, just, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, as Edward discussed earlier, um, since professional service firms have can have economic nexus without physical presence, the real crux of the issue now becomes, well, how do we source service revenue for state purposes? So traditionally, and we're talking decades ago when states mm -hmm. source services, these services were generally performed on site since there was no computers, we weren't in any sort of digital economy. So the rules are pretty straightforward. Um, they were generally sourced to where you perform the services or where the costs associated with those services were performed. Well, obviously things have since changed and we are largely a digital and mobile uh, economy. And therefore states over time have kind of gravitated away from those old school, as I call them, uh, location um, or performance-based rules and really have adopted what's kind of referred to as these market-based sourcing rules. So generally speaking, market-based sourcing rules are less concerned with where you're performing them 
but are looking towards more where are your customers located for sourcing that revenue. Um, and states have various methods for how market-based sourcing is determined. Um, this can include, you know, where are the services being delivered or where are those benefits of the services ultimately being received. And states um, have also realized that not all service industries have the same uh, business models. So states have kind of developed this uh, hierarchy of rules that need to be followed when you're going through this analysis. So currently there's about 36 states, uh, including DC that have adopted some sort of market-based sourcing regime. Um, and I'll note that there's a number of states that actually have different rules depending on the type of entity. So pass-throughs, for example, may have different rules than corporate entities. So I just wanted to point that out as a kind of an additional complexity. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as I alluded to just before, not every industry within the professional services, you know, broader term, have the same business model. And depending on the types of services offered, it can be easier to source compared to others. Um, for example, there are still some types of services um, that are easier to pinpoint, such as medical and dental office services. Um, and I'm not looping in telemedicine services, which have um, recently become a lot more popular over the last few years, obviously, as technology has evolved. Um, but I'm talking about more your in-person um, hospital or office visit type services. Um, also, pest control services, uh, maintenance, and other types of in-person services are generally more straightforward since the delivery and the performance of those services are often in the same location. Where it gets a little bit more challenging is when services are performed remotely or in uh, more than one location. Um, example, these would be financial services firms, engineering, law firms, management consulting, marketing, and other types of support services. I mean, I work for Cherry Becker and I don't always or generally work at my client locations, I'm usually working from home or at our local office. Um, but I have clients all over the country. So this is where the rules can get a little bit more murky and com uh, complicated. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and Peter, I would add there, this is where um, companies have to actually look about look at their systems and what kind of information they can collect. So at Cherry Becker, we had implemented a system quite some time ago that every day we put in what state we're located. And so when we're, we do our sales by state as a firm, we have to filter through all these different rules, but we have the information of where the services were actually performed, where, it's, where that's needed. And then we can run revenue by customer location. Um, but then I would say as you know, some of our very, very large engagements actually would take some time to just really analyze those engagements. And, and there's, there's an ability to have more art than science, right? right. Because it, it, because the rules aren't always specific and you'll look at these more, you know, questions, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, gray to work in, which actually is, is good from a tax consulting perspective. Right. Yeah. I have clients that ask all the time, like, how do we need to capture this revenue? So there's plenty of opportunity to help our clients kind of navigate those issues as we're talking with them about them. Um, so as we're kind of segueing into that topic, um, you know, I, I just wanted to provide some examples where, you know, I've personally worked with some of our clients over the years. I know Kathy and Edward and Tony as well. Um, but the first example is regarding, you know, just a typical law firm. You know, we've assisted law firms in the past with sourcing of their revenue, but it's important to note that not even every law firm, even though they're technically in the same industry, have the same methods to apportion revenue since the facts can be vastly different. So, you know, a, a local law firm, for example, that does personal injury cases, you know, and have mostly local clients, I mean, that's going to be pretty straightforward. Um, most of the time. Um, however, if, if there's a more niche type of law firm that handles, say, intellectual property rights and they defend those patents and copyrights and things, you know, if they have Fortune 500 clients that operate throughout the U.S., um, you know, when they go to defend those rights, you know, where, where does one address where those benefits are actually being received, right? Is it where the client is headquartered or the services are delivered? 
Um, or is there an argument that benefits are received in more than one state or many states or, uh, states or throughout the U.S.? Yeah, so benefits Kathy, received would, for patents, right. right, would be the U.S., yeah. So as Kathy mentioned, it's there's a lot of gray here. It's not a black and white issue. Um, you know, that's why it's really important, you know, to talk to your service provider or Cherry Becker, you know, when you're doing this analysis. Um, uh, then the next, um, you know, example is really for marketing or advertising, you know, this can be tricky to determine where those services are being received. I mean, for example, a national commercial um, is not received everywhere. Um, so the question becomes, are there specific rules that need to be followed within the state's guidance? Or do they provide um, a reasonable approach when the hierarchy of rules does that necessarily maybe fit the type of service that your company provides? Um, you know, maybe there's a population or audience factor approach or something that makes sense, but those are great questions that need to be asked. Um, and lastly, um, you know, I had a client for a number of years in this very niche market. Um, so what they did is what they were a, a wholesale alarm monitoring business, and they would contract with um, alarm retailers like ADT, Simply Safe, CPI, and some of the other big ones. Um, and what they did is they provide these alarm monitoring services on behalf of these retailers' own customers. So the question then became, well, how do we determine where the location of these services are? Is it based on the alarm retailer locations or where my actual uh, client's customers were? Or do we need to look through and see where the subscribers of those services are located? Um, states can have different rules for these types of services um, when you're providing a service on behalf of your actual customer to their customer. So if you have situations like this and, and other areas that kind of come to mind or maybe like benefits administrators, um, these types of services can, you know, it's important to reach out and, and think through these, these questions because it's not always cut and dry. Yeah, I would add to the alarm monitoring services. It's often, it's very common in that industry to get a, a customer base and then sell those monitoring contracts to someone who's going to then perform the monitoring services. So when that company sells the contracts, okay, they're selling an intangible. So when you actually sell the contracts, how do you source that among the states? So there was actually just a, a case in Ohio um, and I, I believe it went to, you didn't have to look through to where the services, underlying services, you could just look to where the company is that they were selling the monitoring contracts to, but you get different results in different states. Uh, so it's a very interesting area. Yeah, the MTC actually has a lot of um, regulations that they've developed over the years that really kind of dive into this issue. So it's, it's, um, it's really interesting. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the big question then becomes, we know we have nexus and sourcing issues. We've identified them. We may have large exposures potentially. So what can Cherry Becker do to help us navigate this? Well, our process um, will be to help you obviously first figure out your sourcing and nexus footprint um, based on the rules. And sometimes this may require a deeper dive into the sourcing rules. You know, as we just went through some of these examples, um, they can be pretty complicated. So um, we would look to see if there are there favorable rulings or positions that we can kind of craft up that are applicable to your, your situation, um, including also nexus limitations, right? Because some states do have bright line tests and there's obviously um, arguments under constitutional um, challenges that, you know, that could also be brought to the table. Um, however, once this analysis is completed, you know, and we've addressed all these uh you know, nexus and sourcing issues, what is the next step? Then we call this remediation. Um, this is basically a conversation that we would have to kind of discuss what's the best path forward. Um, and depending on the analysis, some companies may determine, well, it makes sense to start prospectively filing tax returns. Um, you know, there, if there wasn't a lot of prior liability, for example, in the earlier years and the tax is low or the, or the, or the risk is low, you might be okay just doing that approach. Um, but then there's also what we call voluntary disclosure agreements, um, which would be really um, advantageous in the event that there is a lot of nexus history or large liabilities that have been owed and missed over the years. Um, and basically what VD, we call these VDAs and what they are is their agreements between the taxpayer 
and the state. Um, and there's an agreed upon limited look back period for return filing. It's usually three to four years. And the state agrees to abate all the penalties associated with, the, um, with doing this VDA. Um, and they can't audit you for the period prior to the look back period, which is a huge benefit because absent that VDA agreement, technically the statute of limitations <laughs> doesn't run. So if, if you are found by a state in particular, and I'll use Pennsylvania as a great example because I've dealt with them before, they found some of our clients before and made them go back 15 years to file tax returns. So you can imagine not only the pain to find the data to, to prepare those returns, but also the administrative fees and compliance fees that go to go along with it. Um, so getting that limited look back period, having the penalties abated from the VDAs, there's, it's very taxpayer friendly. Um, and there are definitely such situations where it would make sense to, to move forward with this. Yeah, we're doing a lot of work um, in this area. And it's funny because especially we have a lot of law firm clients and they're the ones that tend to be most aggressive, right? <laughs> um, but then note if notices start coming and uh, but so we've done a lot of work in helping a lot of companies come into compliance. And I think the biggest takeaway here is just to make sure if you do have issues, don't don't let them fester, because if they can't stay contact you first, it's going to be ugly. It's going to be audits. It's going to be numerous years. It's going to be penalties. Where, as Peter just discussed, there are options to come into compliance relatively painlessly and uh, only do a possible like three year look back, no penalties. Um, and, and so there are ways to get it cleaned up. And it's just better to get it cleaned up because, uh, you know, to, the state's technology systems are getting better. They do cross checks, you know, all those kind of things. So it's just easier to get it um, cleaned up, especially if it's a pass through entity environment and the owners are in states where they're subject to tax. Because if it's a pass through entity, the individual is paying the tax. Um, if you can get a limited look back to that, that three-year period, you can amend your resident return and get the refund in your resident state. So it's not additional tax. It's just how the tax is being divvied up among the states. So especially in a pass-through entity environment where the owners are in taxing states, it's a no-brainer to get it cleaned up. Because if you don't get it cleaned up and a Pennsylvania comes along, you have 15 mm -hmm. years worth of returns and tax and penalties and you can only amend three years worth of returns. And that is pure additional tax then. So you really are doubling your tax uh, in that situation. So we do provide a lot of assistance to our clients um, in this area, whether you use us or someone else. I mean, you just really, I just encourage you to really uh, take care of it uh, if, you're, if your company is, is significantly profitable for sure. Yep, agreed. Um, and I think this brings us to our next polling question. I am confident that our company does not have any existing state tax mm -hmm. exposure. So hopefully if there are clients and they've had us involved, they can say yes. If we've recently looked at it, I would say yes, you can. Um, but just, oh, I have to answer. Make sure you answer, Peter. I keep forgetting. As a presenter, I don't always answer those. I can't yeah, miss I another have, one or I thanks won't. For the reminder. <laughs> yeah, I won't get my credit, right? If I don't get them all. Um, okay, so this one's interesting. Um, again, yeah, well, we'll just wait. They have to leave it open for a certain amount of time so that everyone has a chance to answer. And Maddie will put that up when it's available. Um, but yeah, we have, there's just a lot of opportunity. Uh, in professional services in this area. Peter and I have just done a lot of work here. And this it's kind of the impetus for the webinar too, right? Is to really let everybody know, especially on the sourcing side. Okay, pretty evenly split. Okay. Okay. All right. So good. I hope that this webinar like energizes you to say, hey, we really should look at this. Let's look at it. Um, and also I would say, uh, you know, oftentimes law firms aren't necessarily looking at selling, but other professional services firms may want to build up their firm and then take on additional investors. 
or sell their firm or you know have some kind of transaction and when that happens generally there's due diligence that's performed and when you say oh but we're a past your entity it's income tax it's all at the owner level there's no successor liability that's not necessarily true because all the majority not all majority of states have withholding tax non-resident withholding tax requirements so that can be imposed on the entity itself. So it is subject to a due diligence scrutiny and, and you know, a buyer coming along and, and saying, hey, you know, there's too much here or you got to get this cleaned up first or something like that. Um, and the other part is if you take care of it all and get a report and do any voluntary disclosures if they're needed, uh, then if you do take on additional investors or sell, you could just hand them the report. Yep, just looked at this. We're clean. Here's the report. Uh, and you save a lot in professional fees in the due diligence process in that situation as well. Okay, so we will go on to the next topic. And the next topic, mine and Tony's favorite topic that we have been speaking a lot on. I hope this is not redundant for some people that have attended our past through entity webinars. Um, but we we do have you know updated current information, and uh, it, these become quite complex. So Tony, even though you and I have been doing these for a while, we still have to pull and look at everything uh, when we're analyzing these rules for the states because there's all these different nuances. Uh, none of the states are identical. It, it, we were hoping. In fact, there was a model statute even drafted and hoping that the states would just adopt this model statute for past your entity elections. But no, the states had to do their own thing, had to have their own spin. And I'm sure they had reasons for it because they have unique situations and considerations uh, in their state. So uh, let's go to the next slide. And I'll give a, a bit of a background. I'm hoping the majority of people have heard of this, especially on this webinar where most of you said that you, you do have some experience or a lot of experience. We'll go over this uh, pretty quickly so we could get into more of the meat of it. Um, but basically what this relates to is the cap um, on the amount you can deduct on your individual tax return and itemized deductions for state taxes. So if you file your individual tax return, itemized uh, deductions on Schedule A, you have a line for state taxes. TCJA, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, limited that deduction to $10,000. And this really created disparity among uh, entity types. If you're organized as a C corporation and say you have $5 million of state income taxes, that C corporation can deduct those taxes for federal tax purposes and get it and get a deduction, you know, for that entire state income tax amount. That same thing, make him an S corp or a partnership. That same five million dollars of tax liability, you can only deduct ten thousand. So it's huge. I mean, it, it's just can be if it's a very profitable company, it could be just a huge difference. The Democrats saw that. Democrat states saw that as an attack on their states. New York and California in particular, uh, because their taxes are generally higher, and the federal government was really subsidizing some of their tax liability by allowing it to be deductible. Uh, so immediately, states have become started getting involved in all these workarounds. There were other types of workarounds they tried, but this is the one that looks like it works. Uh, there are states that impose tax at the entity level, like Texas excise tax, uh, DC unincorporated business tax. And they were always deductible from the federal level. So, I mean, we had, you know, it, it was consistent with the statutes that are currently in place in the states that imposed it this way. So it's hard for the IRS to say, oh, no, that doesn't work. I think that would be, be difficult, not that it couldn't happen. But what really caused this, and, and so, so let me just say then for people who may not be familiar, the entire, the entire premise is you're making an election to tax the income at the entity level instead of the individual level. So pass-through entities, income flows through generally to the individual. It's reported on the individual federal return, individual state returns. This imposes, it changes the imposition of the tax at the state level to the entity level. So the entity itself would pay the tax. 
deduct that tax and in coming to ordinary income on the K-1, and that lowered income would flow through to the individual, thereby getting a, a benefit for that deduction um, for state tax. That's oversimplification. So there's a lot, there's a lot of different nuances, as Tony um, can attest to. Uh, but that's it, but it's revenue neutral. The reason these statutes have just uh, really been enacted so quickly couple reasons. One is it's revenue neutral to the state. We don't care if it's the entity or the individual, just give us the tax. So it's revenue neutral and it benefits their constituents, right, in the state. It, it benefits them. And then where we really saw the flurry of activity was the IRS issued notice 2020-75 that really kind of appeared to put a rubber stamp on it and say that, yeah, generally we're going to say that, that that works. But with that notice, they said that they will, they are intending to issue proposed regulations. Uh, those regulations still have not been issued. We question whether they will ever be issued um, because the SALT cap really um, expires in 2026. It reverts back in the TCJA and it would it, it would eliminate unless the con unless Congress um, decided to extend or make it permanent which will be really interesting to see because now that the states have made all this work around, I would think it's not really a revenue raiser for them now because of that. So it's interesting on how much money they're actually earning on this limitation uh, and what the ramification would be if, if they allowed it to expire. It might not be as much as they thought because of these workarounds. Um, so that's where we are just from the general background. And Tony, I'll let you get into some of the more specifics now. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. So I'm going to take you through some of just the general mechanics of what you see for the various states that have these optional past serenity tax elections, just to get an idea of at a high level and in a very broad way, how they tend to operate. Um, you know, we're at a point now where there's 32 states that have these and we're really no two that are alike. Um, I've yet to really see two that are perfect carbon copies of one another. Um, it almost seems like you see a lot of similar language. And I think a lot of states that have adopted later on kind of take bits and pieces um, from other states, maybe kind of see what works and what doesn't. Um, so there's a lot of this or that. And, and a lot of these similar kind of issues. Are they a credit method state, income reduced method state? Um, you know, uh, do you still file a composite return or do non-residents not have to file anything anymore? Like on these different issues like that, you kind of see one or the other. Um, but, you know, not too many states have something that's just completely out of left field where the other 31 states aren't doing it. Um, so the majority of states, I would say, it, you know, it's not quite 50-50, but I would say most of them are following what we call the credit method or the credit method states. So how this would work is, you know, the owner of that past serenity a partnership or an S corp, their distributive share of income is passed through to them from the entity like it typically would on their in, individual tax return for the state, they're going to be declaring that income and computing their amount of individual income tax due. However, they're going to get a credit from the entity that would show up on their K-1 um, in an amount of their share of the tax that was paid at the entity level. So that individual would compute their income tax liability for the state, but then immediately offset it with a tax credit that they get from the entity. Um, typically in most states that credit is gonna be a dollar for dollar amount of the tax that was paid at the entity level. However, there are a few outliers here. Um, Connecticut uh, is one of them. Connecticut was also one of the first states to uh, go forward here and adopt some legislation in response to the TCJA um, kind of, you know, set this framework for so many states that followed afterwards to have these optional past serenity tax elections. However, Connecticut is still the only state where it is mandatory. Every other state since has been an optional election. But in Connecticut, uh, it's not a dollar for credit. Um, I believe 80, 87 and a half percent. It's moved around 
Um, and there's even been some talk about just going back to a dollar for dollar credit going forward, but still have not seen the legislative action on that. Uh, Massachusetts is a 90% credit. So uh, in these states, there is a little bit of an opportunity cost to taking the election. Um, Vermont has not passed a pass through entity tax election, but um, it's kind of been an issue with them in getting theirs through. There's been just some competing bills on whether or not they were going to do dollar for dollar or a 90% credit as well. And so like, and so the states made this a revenue opportunity <laughs> for them. Uh, you know, the reason that they were enacting this legislation, it's it's revenue neutral. Now you get the deduction and it helps your helps, you know, your residents, but then they don't give a full credit. And that's actually increasing the tax, which yeah. just doesn't seem fair. In Connecticut, it's mandatory. You don't have, um, you know, election. But anyway, I think that's bad. Yeah. That's bad you know, it, it, and right. And, you know, uh, another approach that a good number of states are taking is it, we call it the income reduce method, where, um, you know, that income would pass through. In most states, you would start out with, you know, your residency, state, your AGI, or in a non-resident state, that amount of revenue um, source to that non-resident state that you receive from the past serenity. Um, but then you would immediately take a subtraction modification to lower that amount of taxable income due in the state. So in this case, you don't really need a credit if, say, like in a non-resident state and you don't have other sources of income there, that you would get to zero taxable income remaining in the state. And no income tax computed. Really just kind of two different approaches to get to the same result. Um, so when notice 2020-75 was issued, there was only seven states that had enacted some kind of entity level tax in response to the TCJ's salt cap. Um, but, you know, as Kathy mentioned, there were jurisdictions, I don't want to say states, leave DC out, you know, jurisdictions that had some kind of entity level tax, whether they called an income tax, an excise tax, something based on or close to being based on income. California for S corporations, a one and a half percent income tax at the S corp level. Um, so uh, New York City also became the first cities to actually um, enact some kind of optional pass through entity tax too. So uh, even some local jurisdictions getting in on the action, you know, with some limitations of, you know, you still have to have like a resident shareholder or partner. But where we are right now, there's 32 states in New York City that have passed legislation for some kind of pass through entity tax. 31 optional, Connecticut being mandatory. Um, currently right now, Hawaii, Iowa, and Montana are set to probably enact legislation very soon um, in those three states. Um, the bills are currently before their governors awaiting signature. Um, Vermont has uh, the three different pieces of competing legislation in their current session right now. Hard to say hasn't been a whole lot of movement on them. Uh, Virginia, Vermont also introduced a bill in their last session that expired without, you know, proceeding much further out of committee. I think that they've been trying this, but haven't really gained a lot of traction, but at least have some current bills out there. Um, so where we are, there's only five states with an individual income tax that have not either enacted or at least have some kind of current bill out there to have a past serenity tax election. Uh, Pennsylvania tried in their 21 and 22 sessions, never got anything through, and this most recent 23 session has just not even tried again. Um, so no activity currently, but that's kind of where we are. That uh, window of states that haven't at least tried or enacted something is getting a lot smaller <laughs> as we come down. And now we're seeing even a lot of states that have enacted something in the last year or two, go back and make technical corrections and fix some of these areas in the first pieces of legislation that they enacted. Um, here's a full list. You know, you can reference this back in you know the materials provided later, but this is currently where we are as of May. Um, so for you know some issues to keep in mind for your credit states, 
most states, they're going to be a refundable credit. So that credit you get from the PTE, um, you know, if you have other sources, maybe you have some losses from another entity or something like that, capital losses, uh, you know, something uh, like that, uh, your credit would be refundable to you if for some reason your tax liability is lower than the amount of actual credit that you receive. However, there's a few states out there that don't refund it, like Arizona and California, that you have a five-year carry forward period to use it. And if you don't, it expires worthless. So some planning may want to go into, you know, electing every year, electing every other year, you know, to make sure that you can utilize all of your PTE credits. Uh, Missouri is the only state where it's not refundable, but it has an indefinite carry forward. Um, and a few states, uh, Mississippi first enacted that it was non-refundable and no had no carry forward, but uh, pretty quickly enacted in March some technical corrections and remediated that, and they went back to being a refundable credit. Um, oh, it went too fast here. Uh, for retroactivity, uh, there's been two states so far that have tried to do some kind of retroactive election, Colorado and Virginia. Colorado going as far back as tax year 2018 when the salt cap first came into effect. Um, so uh, not much we can say on that right now. We're still awaiting guidance from these states to even know what it will look like and how to go through that process. But um, it's a pretty aggressive position to be able to you know, go back that far, um, but it hasn't gained a lot of traction for other states so far. And Tony, we got a question actually on this upcoming slide on base of income, like what's mm -hmm. included, right? And like where, and kind of the, what's the that benefit then at the end of the day? So, so I'm glad that you asked. Um, this is another area where states are going to differ. So um, you have a good number of states now that um, for resident owners of that pass-through entity, what they're going to impose the PT tax on is on their portion of income from the pass-through entity that is not sourced to the state. So not as uh, subject to uh, you know the, the pass-through entity's apportionment or allocation to the state. It's gonna be that un entire unapportioned or unallocated share of income from the pass-through entity that as a resident, you know they would be taxing their home state on their income from all sources. So K-1, total, yep. total K-1 income, regardless right. of apportionment, um, but that's going to be the second bulleted states, right? So that's right. total, total income, which is fantastic. Yep. Um, Bigger pool of income since as a resident, you're going to be taxed on that income anyway. And as long as you get a deduction or a credit then at the individual mm -hmm. level, because you don't want to tax it, but pass your entity, then tax again at the individual. So those states have also provided either a deduction or a credit um, so that you're not double taxed. So the, the second bulleted states are fantastic from that perspective. Yep. And then you have some states that have just taken an approach where it's going to be that uh, state source income from the past serenity for both residents and non-resident owners of the past serenity. So Georgia, it's going to be apportioned income. So the Georgia apportioned income would be the amount that's subject to tax at the entity level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, further oh, considerations. I no, I didn't. Okay. Oh, I thought we're there I did. already. That's <laughs> great. That's great. Okay, so there are a lot of complications. And we're come down to the end. I'll just touch on this uh, very quickly because we're going to respect your time here. But trader business income versus investment income, tiered partnerships, uh, qualification for the election varies by state as well. Uh, some states you actually have just have to have, you can only have individual owners, other states you can have other types of owners. And so the ownership, how these elections work in a tiered environment, can you make the election in just an investment income situation, uh, possibly? Uh, so all of these things take further analysis. Um, also, you say in a California or Virginia where it's entire K-1 income and you have a 50% owner in Virginia, 50% owner in Maryland, that Virginia owner can take the deduction for all of the tax on all the K-1 income, um, but the Maryland owner can't. So then if you have, it, it creates a disparity in the deduction at the entity level. If they're 50-50 owners, do they each get 50-50 of the deduction or can that greater deduction go to the Virginia resident? Um, so hopefully your partnership agreement has like a matching where you can specifically allocate those deductions. I still go back yet, Tony. 
Um, so hopefully your partnership agreement has something, you know, that you can specifically allocate those to the proper one. Um, withholding, California still have withholding requirements, even though the past two entity elections made. They haven't corrected that yet, have they, Tony, that they you've seen? Not. Yeah, so you have to look at the withhold, is withholding still required? Can you file composite? Sometimes in some states, in California, I believe is one of them, if you file a composite, you can't take the credit at the composite level. So if you have lots and lots of partners, you want to think twice about possibly making the election if it's going to cause all those partners to have to file a tax return in the state. So um, we put up the last poll. Would you like to learn more? Yes or no? You could go ahead and, and submit that. But there are a lot of issues. Um, Tony, go yeah to that one. Um, so partnership agreements, you may need to amend who can make the election. Is it is it a, a vote of the owners? Um, do you need a designated partner? Um, you may have conflicts among owners, so you want to make sure whoever's making that election is, is able to make that election, um, and then you could have a lock-in as well. So there's so many different intricacies by every state. You really have to do an analysis of this, but I will close with, if you are a flow-through entity, very taxable or very profitable, very profitable filing in states that have a pass-through entity election, please, please, please please look at that because it's dollars saved. This could be incredible value to you if there is a lot of profit. So with that, we're at the end of our time and we just wanna thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you pa panelists for joining me uh, for all of this. I think it, we gave a lot of information, hopefully it's helpful. And we'd love to follow up with any of you uh, if you would like some follow-up as well. So thank you so much. Have a great day and thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.